I am placing my bet. And my bet is that Kamala Harris is never going to do another sit-down interview before the election. With answers like these? If you can't raise corporate taxes or if GOP takes control of the Senate, where do you get the money to do that? Do you still go forward with those plans and borrow? Well, but we're going to have to raise corporate taxes. Sorry, it's game over. That childlike answer, totally ignoring the reality of the question, which for Stephanie Rule must have been difficult. Stephanie Rule was going along with with Kamala Harris. Oh, yes, the Trump tax plan is terrible. She was the one who told us on Bill Maher's show that it's okay that she doesn't have answers because she's better than Donald Trump. And then was upset that Kamala Harris didn't have answers and then said Kamala Harris didn't have answers and that's okay. That all happened in the span of like 96 hours. And two of those questions in the span, uh, two of those answers in the span of seven minutes. Stephanie Rule, it was it was an awful uh, interview. It was, I, I, as some people d- noted on social media, she might as well have said, dear leader, how are you today? We worry about you constantly. But with an answer like that, how does Kamala Harris even think for a second? How does any of her team think for a second she could do an interview? How does she think she's connecting? How does anybody think that the answer to the question of how are you going to get Republicans to go along is, well, they have to. If you can't raise corporate taxes or if GOP takes control of the Senate, where do you get the money to do that? Do you still go forward with those plans and borrow? Well, But we're going to have to raise corporate taxes. That is the response of a child, which is exactly where her mind puts her. Tony Katz, Tony Katz today. What are you doing, everybody? 833-468-8669. 833-GOT-TONY. That's how you get to be a part of the show. That answer is so childlike. And then to prove how much she has distanced herself from Joe Biden, she quotes him while he's quoting Barack Obama. And we're gonna have to raise, we're gonna have to make sure that the biggest corporations and billionaires pay their fair share. That's just it. It's about paying their fair share. Define it. Uh, You know, I mentioned this on my morning show. I'll say it again. If you can prove to me fair share, I'll quit right now. I'll never do radio again in my life. 833-468-8669. 833-GOT-TONY. That's how confident I am. There's no such thing as fair share. Fair share doesn't exist. It's not real. It was never real. It wasn't real when Barack Obama was lying about it. It wasn't real when Democrats were screaming about it. It wasn't real when Joe Biden was saying it. And it's not real now. It doesn't exist. Every conversation about fair share is a lie. It is emotional pablum meant to gin people up who refuse to ask the question, well, what does that mean? What do you mean when you say fair share? What what number is fair share? This is basic economics. You're talking about taxes. You already create tax rates at certain percentages on a graduating scale. So what's fair share? How much is fair share? Well, Tony, fair share isn't about a tax rate. It's about eliminating the loopholes. No one's stopping you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Eliminate the loopholes. But we all understand that this is about hate and it's about code, right? The idea of pay your fair share is to somehow think that those people on the politically right side of the aisle are somehow taking advantage of the people on the politically left side of the aisle because there are plenty of progressive billionaires, plenty of progressive billionaires. And as uh, as Scott Jennings over there at CNN, the only conservative they've got, points out who is she talking about yeah I'm, I'm still confused about which billionaire rich people are good and which are bad trump is i guess bad the people who support trump are bad the billionaires that she goes around with i guess are good i, I think it's a very muddled thing and i still don't understand i think today was a mess for harris i mean joe biden went on the view today and said he delegated all sorts of authority to her on domestic policy we know that the biden administration is not popular on domestic and economic policy She gave a speech today saying we've got to move past the policies that people think have failed. Well, people think the last four years are a failure. And from what I can tell from this interview tonight, which was really a home game, I mean, going on with this particular interviewer, it was like 
effectively interviewing with her campaign's press secretary. She had nothing, nothing new to say on the economy beyond this ridiculous pablum. You want to talk about aspirations and dreams? They're crushed in this country because of inflation and these kinds of interviews and the day that she had today are not going to solve it. So, Jane- The aspirations conversation came from another answer about the people who are part of, of her plan. The people who, who she's uh, talking about. The people she allegedly cares about when talking about all her ambitions or all their ambitions. But still, there are lots of Americans who don't see themselves in your plans. For those who say these policies aren't for me, what do you say to them? Well, if you are hardworking, if you have uh, the dreams and the ambitions and the aspirations of what I believe you do, um, you're in my plan. That is the end. I want to say for the record that she's never going to do an interview again. Her team cannot be serious. The most friendly of friendly confines on MSNBC. The most friendly of friendly hosts in Stephanie Rule, who you'll remember that she was uh, on uh, with, with Bill Maher just the other day. Just the other day, and she was as clear as can be. Not having answers doesn't mean anything. She was talking to Brett Stevens, formerly of the New York Times, and she wanted you to know quite clearly that having answers was meaningless. Five years ago, was asked if he could name the president of Pakistan and other people. He had no idea. And people said this guy has no command of, uh, of, of, of foreign policy. And it turned out to be a prescient set of questions. It's not too much to ask Kamala, say, are you for a Palestinian state if Hamas is going to run that state? Okay. Yes or no? And let's say you don't like her answer. Are you going to vote for Donald Trump? No, I'm not. Kamala I just said Harris I'm not going to vote for her. is not running for perfect. She's running against Trump. We have two choices. And so there are some things you might not know her answer to. And in 2024, unlike 2016 for a lot of the American people, we know exactly what Trump will do, who he is, and the kind of threat he is to democracy. I don't- Still pushing this threat to democracy line, trying to get him killed. I... I would say it to her face without question. But what an argument. You don't need to know. Because whatever her position is, it's still better than Trump's. I I don't know that for sure. I have no idea if that's the case. Yet here she comes after the interview to say she was unhappy with Kamala Harris's answer uh, about the economy. I do, but here's what's a little tricky. She doesn't answer the question around if the GOP is controlling the Senate, if she can't raise corporate taxes, where is she going to get the money from, you know, to expand the child tax credit and do all the things she wants to do? And she says, we just have to do it. You're right. That's an absolutely terrible answer, an absolutely horrific answer. But then, Stephanie Rule, you tell us that it's totally fine that she didn't answer in yet another interview. Work And one could watch that and say, well, she didn't give a clear, direct answer. That's okay, because we are not talking about clear or direct issues. When we're talking about the economy, it seems to be a clear and direct issue. Now, we could have differences over how to handle things, but we certainly know the subject. And we certainly know, based on all economic data, that too much cash and not enough stuff in an economy leads to inflation. And we certainly know that increasing interest rates helps reduce the amount of cash in a system and therefore lowers uh, the inflation, which is the rise of costs in goods because the goods are harder to come about, so your dollar is worth less. How do you make your dollar worth more? That's the question. And there are people who absolutely can openly and honestly and clearly and freely have this debate. It's just that Kamala Harris isn't one of them. She doesn't understand it. We're not talking about clear and direct issues. Yes, we are. 
as clear as day. You know it and I know it, but somehow they don't know it. And they want to try and spin it as it's okay that her answers are just this silly, like her talking about housing. Small businesses. Why do those biggest corporations and CEOs do that? Because they know those kinds of investments, like in our small businesses, in startups and entrepreneurs, actually strengthens America's economy overall and everyone benefits. So this is not about bilking anybody, but it is certainly about saying, let's make sure that we create opportunities for everyone to grow wealth. I believe that it is not sufficient and it should not be our goal to just make sure everyone is working. That should be the baseline. That should be a given. And let's create an economy where people have the ability to buy a home, to start a business, to take a nice vacation from time to time. I want all of those things for everybody, and I want them to work for it. She doesn't discuss that. When she talks about buying a home, different homes, right? Because some people can only afford a two-bedroom ranch, 1,100 square feet, and some people are going to be able to afford five bedrooms and six baths and 8,200 square feet. Right. We're not talking about equalizing it out, are we? Oh, you better believe that she is. Just so you understand, Uh, somebody who actually believes in equity laughably like her, they totally believe in that all being the same. Meritocracy be damned. But Stephanie Rule continues. Right. For people who want to buy a home, yes, getting a twenty five thousand dollar kicker would be great. But it's not just affording a home. We don't have enough in this country. You're absolutely right. And one of the main problems are regulations and rules, strict, strict rules at a local level. How does the federal government cut through all that red tape and get down to, I don't know, the suburbs of Pittsburgh yeah. and say, we're going to have to build some affordable housing here? How do you connect the two? So you're absolutely right. So across our country, People rightly are concerned about the cost of housing. So it's home ownership, to your point. Uh, we need more supply. That is, without any question, part of the solution. Creating more supply under my plan includes creating tax incentives to work with the private sector and home builders. Part of my goal and the plan would be to create 3 million new housing units for rent. Kamala Harris is going to start building houses, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you like the brutalist style of architecture because you're not going to get what you want. You're going to get 600 square feet for a family of four and you're going to be told to say thank you. The federal government is going to build how I saw them try and build a website for Obamacare. These people couldn't build a house if their life depended on it. And yours will if you live in that thing. You live in condos built by the government. You might as well live in condos in Surfside. That's how bad. Too soon? Can I get a rule? No? Yeah. That's how bad it's going to be. It's going to be awful. By the way, let's not make fun of Surfside. Uh, An absolute tragedy when that condo uh, collapsed. People died. Awful, awful stuff. She's going to build her way, our way into prosperity. The government. The private sector can't do it. Government's going to have to do it. Never mind the whole $25,000 thing, which is going to lead to an increase in homes by $25,000. On every answer, her plan is childlike. And every answer is delivered without a level of conviction that makes you believe that she gets it. Her answers are delivered like, here's how I deliver the poll tested answer, as opposed to here's the conviction and the understanding of how to answer a question, because I actually understood the question that will make the viewer at home say that is a good idea. And no one did that. Guys, no one did that anywhere. No one watched that interview and said, yep. Yep, I wasn't sure before, but she's got a mastery of the economy and she's got my vote. You know, she put out like an 82-page plan. She had a speech at the Economic Club of Pittsburgh before the interview, uh, and and, and I think it was before the interview. 82-page plan. Well, Dr. Matt Will has read it, and he'll join us later to break it down. If you think the speech was an issue, I mean, the, the interview was an issue, man, you should check out the speech and how little of a grasp she really has on the economy. I'm Tony Katz. This is Tony Katz Today.